Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. Oh, I'm tired. I'm tired, Teresa. <laughs> Got the kiddos. Hopefully you all can hear me okay. Check one, two. Sybilis. Sybilis. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I think this frame is a little bit better. I feel like I usually have a lot more higher ground. So someone has contacted me about helping do some of the um, uh, moderation and, and I'm going to talk to her uh, this week about it and try to get her the codes to help moderate. So we'll do that. Um, so we might have another day of, of people asking me if I woke up and chose uh, autism today, or but maybe not. Don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe. My kids have been, my kids watch the, these videos. It's really crazy. These adults do all these like skits and stuff and they become really popular. Yes, in case Kelly says something inappropriate. Um, What is it like subscribe? I got to get it all down, but don't forget. To, it does help if you like and, and subscribe, turn on those notifications. Um, my son told me that, um, <laughs> he's like, dad, he's like, next time you try to raise funds, tell everybody I'll do a pull up for each donation. <laughs> so maybe that'll be a new a new fundraiser, pull-ups pull for Jesus, hallelujah. Um, I just did a podcast with uh, my friend Helen, Helen Rollins, and it's the Yes Jesus podcast. Um, you can find the link on my Instagram, literally off of uh, click the bell, click the bell. There you go, thank you. Um, uh, we, we did that, so you can see it on Instagram. Or on my face, I think it's in my Facebook stories right now. I'll put it on my Facebook proper. Uh, totally, we're totally Twitter free. We got off there uh, just because I was going on there all the time, and I ended up reading like all this negative stuff. And then we only got like two likes at most, but usually no likes. So I just figured X or Twitter is no longer really valuable for us to, and, and, and not really working well. So. One less uh, media site to worry about, I guess, um, online site. Plus, we do so much on Instagram. I really do enjoy Instagram. And we do have a, oh gosh, what's that? Uh, threads. We do have a Revolution Threads, and we do have a Revolution in the Jay Baker Threads, so you can check that out as well. Um, I'm also hoping to do uh, the Theology and Beer Camp in October. And you can get a discount code uh, for that event in uh, Colorado. I think it's October like 17th, 18th, and 19th, I believe are the dates. And I'm going to be doing that, which I'm excited to be on the road a little bit. Uh, I haven't been on the road in a while. So uh, nice to be working and on the road. Uh, had, a, had a job interview, and that was pretty cool. Yes, yes, there we go. Thank you, Kelly. It is 10, 17 through the 19. And uh, so glad to be a part of something. Um, I know I'm going to be doing some stuff with the emergent people, and I don't know if I will have my own talk or not. I would like to, because I'd like to talk about peacemaking and how we can not scapegoat each other and how we can work together. And, and that's a little bit what we're going to talk about today as well. Um, But I am a little bit tired. Did I say that? Did I mention it? 
I am. I'm tired. I'm tired. Um, life is tough, y'all. Life is tough. Life is, is uh, there's a lot going on in the world. And there is just so much to keep us divided. And uh, that's part of the inspiration for today's talk. Because I was going to, today was going to be on Paul Tillich's You Are Accepted. And I love that talk. And we're going to do it maybe next week or the following week. We're going to go through that. You Are Accepted by Paul Tillich. Google it. Look it up. It's fantastic. Share it with your neighbors and your friends. It's one of the best sermons ever written. Because I, I he never did a vote. He never recorded it. But we got ahead of that and had Peter Rollins record it for us, read it for us, and put it up on our, uh, it's on YouTube, it's here on YouTube, it's on Apple, it's on Spotify, you can listen to the amazing Peter Rollins uh, read Paul Tillich's sermon, uh, you are accepted as well. So there's a lot of different ways to, to interact with that, and, it, and it's really fantastic, it's really great, and it's uh, you know, if you ever like, what is revolution all about? <laughs> that would be a good one to read. So um, today I wanted to, uh, I guess that's the update. Um, I always do the pitch at the end for fundraising, but I, I just want to always make sure that people don't feel like, you know, if you're not in a financial place to, to help promote, to do donate to revolution, don't donate. <laughs> I never want people to feel pressure uh, to give. Um, but if you're in a place and you know that you're in a place where you can help us and help our work and uh, maybe realize that other people aren't, you know, that would be great. We can always, we can really use your support. Um, you know, uh, just to be clear, like last year I went six months without pay. So, um, you know, Revolution isn't trying to get rich on anybody. We're just trying to survive and, and literally just live up to a certain level you know <laughs> just try to keep our head above water a little bit so anyway i'll talk about that more later um but today i wanted to talk about we talk a lot about arguing well and disagreeing well and scapegoating and not scapegoating and we'll talk a lot about that but i felt like i needed to uh, put my scapegoating where my mouth is or to put my money where my mouth is and talk a little bit about this um, it's a strange time because, you know, uh, it's really wild to, to watch like the left, like Democrats and then leftists, which I'm more of a leftist now, but <laughs> watch people really freaked out and arguing with each other over. I, it does kind of sometimes boil down to putting our identities within uh, politics, and I, I really try not to do that as much. But um, it's weird to see like now there's infighting all on that side, you know. And you're hearing a lot of similar things that I heard about uh, Christianity growing up. Um, does tapping the emojis on the right help bring others to the live like it does on TikTok? I don't know if that if it works that way or not. That's a that's a good thing. I would I'm gonna Google that and find out because then we can be like heart 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 because right now it's just like like and subscribe and turn on that bell. Um, Maybe if I just started talking about my action figures and playing with toys, <laughs> I could be like a million likes because that's what my kids like to watch. Um, <laughs> Reenact movies. Um, I might start, uh, maybe I'll start lip syncing to my favorite British songs and dress up like, no, anyway. So scapegoating. And so this hit me the other night. You know, I had already planned out the whole Tillich thing. We were going to do the Tillich thing and... And a lot of my ideas for talks really come when I put my head on the bed and, um, and, and I can never sleep and I get racing thoughts. And so I try to turn those racing thoughts into productive thoughts. Sorry, I'm so tired, everybody. And um, it's a gloomy day here in Seattle. I think the sun's coming out, though. And I started to think about... Like, it's easy to ask people to stop scapegoating evangelicals, you know? I have lots of Batman action figures. You know, and say, oh, you can't always say they're bad. But, you know, like, I'm like, what positive have I been saying about evangelicals and people on the right? You know, what have I been... We're all at my house very excited about this uh, Red Hulk that we got at McDonald's. 
But what positive thing have I been saying about evangelicals? And I don't think I've been saying a whole lot. <laughs> you know, I'm like, we can't scapegoat those bastards. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to talk about the influence that evangelicals and conservatives whoa, have had in my life. Because if we're going to truly be a place where we have diverse thinking, we're going to have uh, conservatives and evangelicals as well as progressives and atheists and all sorts of different people who think different thoughts here today. And that's the goal. Because we revolution has always been about grace, uh, as long as I've been the pastor. And, uh, and it, it's really evolved these past couple of years into something about peacemaking. With so grace, where we find help find peace with ourselves, uh, and then we give grace to help find peace with them. But what does it look like to make peace? And as you guys know, I I, I read a lot of like Dr. King and, and and people who are legendary peacemakers. I've just finished another book on John Hume, and I'll tell you what I got to like I think it was chapter 22 on that book, and I was just like sobbing about the peace process in um, in Northern Ireland. And the years that it took and uh, the, the wear that it had on John Hume's life, but just the beauty that it also affected one of the greatest places on earth, uh, Belfast, which I love. Um, strangely enough, uh, tonight, I'm not going, but Stiff Little Fingers is in town. Alternative Ulster <laughs> on their last U.S. tour, but hopefully I'll go out to Belfast one day and see them play. Um, I think they live, I think one of them lives here though. Um, anyway, so evangelicals and, and what, you know, the experiences that I had and growing up and, and, you know, and what is my identity? Is my identity progressive? Is my identity evangelical? Is my identity Christian? Is my identity punk rocker? Is my, you know, we have all these identities and these like ways we try to relate to each other and send each other and, and assume what each other is. And it's not the best place to be, you know, and then we often toe the line if we want to be popular. Um, is it Pentecost? See, I, I'm so out of the loop. Yeah, loving other Christians. Well, Paul, the apostle, was talking about, uh, like, in, in, I'm <laughs> from those guys. I'm going to owe myself a dollar because I was like, I'm not going to talk about Galatians today because we are done. <laughs> but in Galatians, he said, you know, love each other, especially your Christian brothers and sisters. And I think he was saying that because of Galatians. But I also think maybe he was saying that because sometimes those are harder people to love. Um, but, you know, in the Bible, it talks about like, well, if you only love those who are good to you, what, what is that worth? You know, what difference does that make from anybody else? If you only loan to those people who can repay you, what difference does that make? What, what is that worth, you know? And then starts going through this impossible task of talking about picking up your cross, of loaning to people who can't pay you back and doing good to those who can't return the favor and, and that kind of stuff. And that's service. And I can say easily that I, I experienced evangelicals who did that type of thing growing up. Um, and so I want to say, like, without evangelicals in my life, I would not be sitting here. And so when I was growing up, I was a part of my parents' huge mass ministry, church, playground, whatever you want to call it. And it was an evangelical church. Um, they tried not to be too political, which is strange because my dad's very political now. But back then they didn't really talk politics all that much. And so growing up in that atmosphere, there were things that were bad. And we cover a lot of those. And I think we cover enough of those. Like the whole like coming home and nobody's home and you think Jesus came back and you got left behind. That was always a fun one. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to, I wanted to talk about the positive things, and I grew up, and the great thing about the evangel, because evangelicals are as different as Christians and different as people. Like we don't think that. Like we, it's easy to say like white evangel, like then we start saying white evangelicals, which I don't get because I've realized that all evangelicals are unique and different, even just this, you know, the color of their skin. But anyway, growing up, 
at Heritage USA, there was so much diversity and women could be preachers. Um, they, so we weren't obviously Southern Baptists or Calvinists. Um, equality was a no-brainer. So there is a fact is that there was a lot of damaging theology, but there was also a lot of people who lived past that. And, you know, I grew up, you know, not really understanding why anyone would, you know, till about 11, not even really understanding what racism really could understand it. I mean, the first time I saw a uh, Klan march was I was probably 12 years old in North Carolina, and I saw, and I was like, what the F, you know, to my dad, and he was like, Charles, you know, because <laughs> he's worried about my language. Um, but it was just community, and it was diverse community, and we went to school with diverse people, and diverse people preached and came all from all over the world and sat on the stage and were my family, friends, and neighbors, and and people who worked there, you know, and it was this, th there was this really great atmosphere about that. And so it's really easy to like sit back and be a, you know, a Monday or Tuesday quarterback. I don't know what day football is. I thought Monday was Sunday, but maybe Monday day quarterback. It's really easy to sit and judge everybody and say, well, everybody's like this. Well, everybody's like that. But like, if you look at someone like Mark Driscoll versus someone like Joel Olstein, they have differences, you know, there, there's, there's differences there. If you look at, there's someone compared to Jerry Falwell to Jim and Tammy Faye, there were big differences there. And so we often use evangelical like a big blanket statement to say something negative about a group of people. Um, and that's judging. It's not thinking through it. It's not paying attention to nuance. And that's what's incredible about nuance. And, and it, it was, I think it was Jung, who said people judge because they don't want to think because sometimes thinking is too difficult. And when we really think about it, we have to have nuance. You know, um, not everybody's good, not everybody's bad, not everybody's all good, not everybody's all bad, and we have to see the nuances and we have to see some of the positive things. And I think that was one of the hardest things for me growing up after my parents' scandal was is that no one talked about the, the good things, like how elderly people were working, like people with disabilities were part of Heritage USA. Um, you know, it was one of the most inclusive places I think I'd ever been. And no one ever seemed to really talk about that. And for me, that was something that I felt like I almost took for granted, you know, because years later, I would, when I was in public school and, and even in like Baptist, I went to a Baptist school for a little while, I saw the division. I saw these different things, but you know, a lot of people are like private school started so they could be, you know, su white supremacy. But my parents had a private school, but it was completely mixed. You know, we were all, we were all just living life together. And I feel grateful for growing up in that. And I also feel like that's probably why I have so much compassion and probably why I do the work I do. Um, what it, it was, it was quite an, quite an interesting, you know, it wasn't a, a, a utopia, a utopian existence by any means, but it was a safe place where people could be and people could be different. And uh, I remember, you know, Catholic nuns coming to Heritage USA and being like, oh, there's nuns here. Oh my gosh, I thought we didn't think they went to heaven, <laughs> you know, but my parents were in that time in their lives, just in my mom has always been that way, but my parents at that time just were not about division. They were about bringing people together. And, it, and I, to truly see that was quite amazing. You know, it was, uh, there wasn't any like, you know, there wasn't like, oh, we have to be progressive or we have to be conservative or we have to be woke or we have to do any of this stuff. It was just, we've got to love people. And the best way to love people is make things accessible to love people. You know, make, make the studio accessible for people in wheelchairs and for people who are you know, elderly and do this type of thing. And so that was really, a neat thing, and, and the fact that they, you know, my parents did prison ministries back then, and, and homeless ministries, and food bank, they had a huge food bank, and, and so I grew up seeing that that was important, and caring about others was important, and that was in an evangelical world, you know, it would be easy for me, I could tell you a lot of bad stories, of bad things I heard, I can tell you bad things that happened, 
But today what I'm trying to do is say nuance and, and say like, listen, it's not just about not scapegoating, but it's also realizing that there's some positive things that we may have been ignored all these years. Even for a lot of us who were hurt by the church and came out of the church angry and hurt and now are doing something different, we don't realize that even those moments have allowed us to become who we are and allowed us not to become those things. I, I was thinking the other night, like had my parents not had their scandal and all that stuff had happened, would there be a chance that maybe something would have shifted and where did you would have been more conservative like my dad is now and that I would be up there being more conservative and saying things and out of touch, you know? Who knows? You just can't, you, you can never know. But I learned a lot of not how people don't want to be treated and how it feels to be scapegoated by both sides, by the most conservative and by the most... Uh, uh, most liberal people saying, you know, these people are horrible. Um, but I, I also saw my, my family when the, when the cameras were off. And these are two evangelical teenagers that my parents were, not at the, when they were my parents, but who grew up. And even after the scandal, watching my parents do these things where they were always reaching out to people who were in need. And that sticks with you, you know, but that's the stuff people don't talk about. So when you're being scapegoated, all the good stuff goes out the window and all of a sudden there's no more nuances. When we're canceling, the cancel culture just does away with the nuance and we say this person is the bad thing that they did in that moment in their life and there's no grace, there's no forgiveness. Um, so that was interesting to me. Like I, I often, you know, like this, that guy, that football kicker who just came out and said women should be in the kitchen and blah, blah, blah. like that's I to me is insane I never grew up like that so it's even twice as insane and I think it's garbage I think that kind of message is garbage I disagree with it and uh, I will disagree with it forever and I would sit down and have a conversation with that young man and say listen you've missed something big here and let's go over and look at the history of this type of thinking and why it's why you're misguided why you've been victim to some uh, bad theology and, you know, try to set that person free. Um, so that was a, an interesting way to grow up. And then when we lost everything, and I remember when my dad went to, pe my dad went to prison, there, you know, I always talk about, oh, there was, you know, nobody was there, but, but there was in that, in, 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 in uh, we, he went to, uh, he was in prison in Minnesota, and um, in Minnesota, there was a pastor, an Assemblies of God pastor, who found out by, by my dad, because he was a pastor, he knew he could go visit my dad, went and visited my dad, and then he would pick us up at the airport, and sometimes it, we sometimes we could fly into where he was, but usually we'd fly into Minneapolis, which was about two hours from the prison. They'd pick us up, take us there, make sure we got to a hotel, make sure we were eating, make sure we had what we needed. Uh, that the church was always there. When I did my dad's appeal, I, we literally worked in his church offices on the appeal. And so, uh, you know, this was evangelical, this conservative evangelicalism, saying like, "Hey, we're going to help." There wasn't a lot of help, but there was help. And that's the, new, that's the thing we've got to remember. We use these broad strokes and say all these things. Like when I hear deconstruction, I don't even know what it means anymore because so many people have got to use these broad strokes. Someone asked me today, like, are you a deconstructionist, affirming deconstructionist? And I'm like, I'm not sure what you mean. Do I affirm deconstruction? Do I affirm gay people? And then they explained it to me. But um, we have all these words are starting to kind of lose their meaning a little bit. And... We like that kind of just like instant fast way of thinking rather than thinking with nuances. Um, you know, but here's this family who reached out and helped us. There was a, a couple where I was living in Florida and going to school and it was just my mom uh, raising me. And there was this couple, Faye and Ray, and they were from Canada and they were also like evangelicals. And they would fly down every few months and they would come like when I was about to start school and go like, hey, you probably you want some new clothes for school and make sure we had that and take us out to dinner and just love on us a lot. 
so it's like, to me, those people were evangelicals too. There was another guy named Donnie Beck. And um, I remember I was having a really rough time at school and I was feeling really depressed and I was having to go out to my mom's office all the time. And Donnie worked there with my folks. And um, Donnie would, you know, drive me around and I had to go to a skateboard. I wanted to go to the skateboard store. Me and my friends all started skateboarding again. And, and I was in ninth grade, they were all seniors. And so I said, oh, I want to get a skateboard. And I got the, saved up the money to go get the skateboard. And so Donnie would take me there. Now Donnie would listen to, oh gosh, what is that conservative radio guy? Uh, Rush Limbaugh. I was 16. I didn't care anything. He would listen to Rush Limbaugh. The only thing I remember about Rush Limbaugh is that he, he, he would Snapple. He had advertisements for Snapple. <laughs> the greatest stuff on earth. Get yourself a Snapple. And he would listen to this guy all the time. Every time I was in his car, he's listening to this guy. And we would just, I would just talk to him and we'd have conversations. And I was slowly becoming a Democrat. I was a lifelong Democrat. And, uh, and we went to the store and Donnie Beck was probably about 350 pounds. And I remember he was like, oh, I'll just stay in the car. And I'm like, well, why don't you want to go in the car? And why aren't you going to go in the store with me? And he's like, well, you know, I, I know I'm kind of heavy and that can be embarrassing. And I was like, no, Donnie, like if anybody's going to be embarrassed by anything, I'm going to be embarrassed by myself. You come in with me. We're friends. And, uh, but it was always nice to have someone who was an adult who would listen to me and talk to me. And, and, and be friends with me. And this was an evangelical Christian. Um, at this time, I started noticing LGBTQ people and I started arguing with some of the people in my, around like, hey, these people deserve to have the same rights as we. It doesn't matter if you don't agree with them or not, they deserve to have the same rights. And I would have really interesting conversations with a lot of these folks. Um, about that stuff. And it wasn't always like, you're done, we're going to cut you off, you know, oh, you know, it wasn't like, you're canceled, you know. I mean, usually the people who are doing that are the people who run the events or run big churches, and so you don't get to speak again anymore. But sometimes the congregation and the people are actually a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more open and a little less fearful of keeping their jobs, if you know what I'm saying. Um... I'm going to jump around a few different places to tell these stories because they're all over my head and I, I, I took a bunch of notes, but I just want to give this. One of the things that was also interesting is at, when I dropped out of high school and my mom and dad got divorced, I li ended up living with a family friend, Shirley Fulbright, who's like my second mom. And we moved to St. Petersburg, Florida. And I worked for this, uh, CT I think it was Christ Christian Television Network, CTN. It was this little Christian network that was in St. Petersburg, Florida. And the guy who owned the station gave Shirley a, uh, and myself, he had an, he was gonna build, he had bought two condos and he was gonna put them together. He's like, listen, I'm not gonna, I haven't done the construction on this condo. Why don't you guys live there? Because obviously Jay needs a place to live and Shirley, you can run the ministry for there. And then they offered me a job at the Christian Television Network, which was funny because I had done interviews on that show before when I was a teenager. I don't know why. On one of their shows, um, I guess people were interested in what was going on with my parents. And so they hired me. Well, first they got me to volunteer, but I didn't always show up because it was volunteer. And then they hired me. Now, I would always go smoke my cigarettes out in the back. You know, I'm 16, pissed off at the world, chain smoking. And uh, where I would smoke, there was a camera, and they knew I smoked, you know. And I remember the, uh, the guy who owned the place was like, listen, I don't mind if you smoke. I just don't want you to die. And he's like, I'll, I'll give you $100 if you can go 30 days without a cigarette, something like that. And I did. I ended up doing that. And then I fell off the wagon again for a long time and started smoking again. But... The thing was, is these people loved me and gave me a job and gave me a place when not a people wouldn't. And these were evangelical Christians doing what they felt was the calling of Christians, not of a evangelicals or not of this, you know. And I remember I would wear, I would just, I was take the piss out of it. I would wear, I remember I had a t-shirt that said, kill your TV. And I'd wear that and I was doing camera work, kill your TV, you know. And I wore a Clinton Gore shirt and they were talking about on the TV like, Bill Clinton is the Antichrist, you know, how evangelicals do. But I was still there 
still accepted and still loved, even though I might have been kind of a rebel. Because they said, well, we got to love this rebel. And so, you know, those are the things I think about all the time when I hear, you know, this, this like, you know, if we focus on the most hateful people like that kicker or like Driscoll or, oh gosh, what's that guy who wrote the Bob, Baptist guy who wrote a Bob Elf, but MacArthur, you know, if we want to sum up everybody as like those folks, like three or four or five, six, seven, maybe you know, folks, then we're going to be scared. And it's easy to scare each other. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of times people use fear, and I think even sub unconsciously use these fear tactics and talk about these people because it helps get people on board. It helps raise money. You know, one of the best ways to raise money is either, you know, promise people that God's going to bless them 500 times or say, I'm going to save you from these people, those people. And so that's what starts happening within the evangelical world often as we see like, oh, the gays are going to take over abortion, going to help us save you from that, donate now, you know. But the other thing that we have going on too is we have people on the, you know, on the left doing very similar things like, you know, well, we'll save you from Donald Trump, we'll save you from John MacArthur, we'll say, oh, they're all idiots and we'll save you from these people, you know. And, and, and in a way, it's this, this cycle you know, it's, 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 it becomes a cycle of like, well, now the conservatives are raising money off of these liberals and the liberals are making money off of these conservatives. They're both scapegoating each other, but it's also very profitable for both of them to do that. You know, so it's like, I get to post all the bad things they said about me and then they post the bad things that you said about them. And they're both got this like little echo chamber of supporters and people who are like, yes. And so it's kind of this idea of fear, hate, and scapegoating that's creating the system that stays alive. And for me, as someone who feels called about grace and peacemaking, I'm going like, I'm going to want to dismantle the system. Now, when you go in and say, I want to dismantle the system, they're going like, this is how we butter our bread, you know? Hold on a second, you know? And sometimes it's unconsciously happening. Like they think, well, they're really doing the right thing, but they've just gotten so caught up in a system that benefits them and that's, you know, well, we got to talk about the other. And we don't ever start to realize that we're all human beings and that the only way we're ever going to work things out, the only way this world is going to be better is if, one, if we stop that system from scapegoating and stop us from being separate all the time and start to learn to respect each other's diversity and tolerate each other's diversity. But a big part of that, and which is this would be the really hard part of that, is getting religious religion out of politics. Um, because that's when we start making laws, taking our, our, our convictions and making laws and hurting one another and the, well, you have to do what I believe. You know, that's, that's not, <laughs> that doesn't work. I think that would be a big first step for us to, to start becoming a community of humanity is, is, is to say, well, we want to make sure politics takes care of everybody, that everybody has the right to a job where they're paid and can have health insurance and we all have roads and, you know, partisan politics is always othering. We're always othering the person. And that's the problem I have with having a two party system in our country is it's so, you know, this, this binary thinking of the goodies and the baddies, black and white and this. And, we, and so we get into these ways of thinking. Um, So, you know, grateful for that. Now, when my dad got out of prison, um, I had worked so hard on my dad's case. And when he got out of prison, I thought, well, this is my time to enjoy life a little bit. I was 18 and um, I had had a drinking problem. And so I was partying a lot, especially because he was in a halfway house. So I had the kind of this house to myself. So I invite my friends over and be like, dude, let's party. And we were renting a house then, and this house had a bar in the bo bottom area where I was staying. So I'd be like, Ooh, you know, and then I would go to down to Charlotte and really party hard. Um, you know, I was 17 at the time, 17. Yeah, I had maybe 17, 18 and um, I think 18. And so. So my dad got really worried about me and this Assemblies of God pastor said, well, we have this thing in, in Phoenix, Arizona called, um, what was it called? It was called, 
master's commission. And it was this thing for young evangelicals. You join this master's commission and they take you out to poor areas and you feed people and you preach the gospel and you win them to Jesus. You know, it was kind of the thing. It's like, we'll feed you and we'll get you to come to Jesus because that's what we really care about. Still wasn't a, a bad thing that they were doing. But I never felt that. Like I had grown up, I had lived in Atlanta for a while with my friend D.E. And one of the things I always wanted to do is work with people who didn't feel like they fit in the church, people who felt like they felt out, didn't fit in. And so I got up to Arizona at this giant mega church, this giant Assemblies of God mega church. And there was this program where it was like, you couldn't be, no piercings, no this, no that, you know, all these rules. And I was like, oh, you know, not this again. I just can't can't live in this. And there were a little couple of kids saying, we want to start this thing called Revolution. We've already done one event. And, you know, punk rockers and skaters and hippie kids and people who just kind of feel like they're falling through the cracks of the church. And I was like, well, this sounds awesome. Where can we do it? And they're like, well, the Assemblies of God, this big uh, Phoenix First Assembly has this building called Carmen Center down at, by the end. It used to be a bar and now it's just this building down there that they said we could use once a week. We have to share it with other people, but we can use and we could do a revolution thing. We do music and stuff. And I'm like, this is what I want to do. So I went into the master's commission leader and I said, listen, this is what I want to do. And he's like, well, you can't be in master's commission and do revolution. So I called my dad and was like, dad, you told me if I came out here, uh, you would, you know, if, if I didn't like it, I could come home. And I'm like, I don't like this master's commission thing, but there is this thing called revolution. And there's a couple kids my age who want to start this kind of weird church for, you know, we're going to have bands and things like that. And I'm like, what do you think? And would you support me to do that? And in master's commission, you, they put you in an apartment building and you live in. I'm like, but so I had to leave the apartment. I had to move in with other people. I had to you know, do all. And my dad's like, yes, I will help support you do that. So you've got evangelical Jim Baker. You've got the Evangelical Assemblies of God saying, well, we'll give you a building to do that. And I remember their youth groups and stuff weren't allowed to come to our services or anything. But again, the reason I'm saying this is there were evangelicals who are willing to take a chance. And I would later work with this church years later in L.A. and put on a big event out there, a big concert out there. And I said, hey, you know, there's, they're like, there's no smoking on the property. I'm like, listen, you want, we want everybody to come to this show give us a smoking section. And it was a big deal for them. It wasn't a big deal for me. Um, I'm like, you got to give it out, at least outside, give us a little area where people can come out, have a cigarette and then come back in, you know? And they said, okay, okay, we'll do it, you know? And it was a fight. I mean, it was there. I can tell you a lot, a lot of fights I had with people there and how depressing it was and, and, and the battles, but there was also the things of like, okay, we'll let you do this. Like I was always pushing the boundaries, you know, even when I would go to these festivals, I'm like Cornerstone, I can remember Glenn Kaiser, who ran the festivals, calling me in and being like, you know, you just, you focus too much on grace and, you know, you're giving people licenses. You've got to be careful with that stuff. But the point was, they still had me back. They still worked with me. So you have to kind of say like, I got an audience going to these Christian festivals, these evangelical Christian festivals all over the country, even though I was radical and saying, you got to love the LGBTQ people. You got to, all that was fine up until I said, it's okay to be LGBTQ. That's when they said, you're out, buddy. But the point is, is these people were willing to invest in my life. When I left LA and I went back to Atlanta, I went and met with this pastor. And at the time it was a uh, church of Christ, uh, a building that was, uh, it's called Safe House, Mount, Mount Perrin Safe House. And Mount Perrin was a Church of Christ. They ended up giving Safe House the building and letting them have it. And so they're no longer a Church of Christ, but they're still evangelicals. And they're this big evangelical Church of Christ thing. And I go down and I call Philip and I say, Philip, um, if you give me an office, I had worked for Philip a little bit before with, with, with some stuff with homeless stuff because I was really had a heart for the homeless uh, and I said I said but I want to do revolution will you give me an office give me a paycheck and let me do revolution in your building I mean like what was that and for some reason he was like sure let's do it let's give it a shot and I, I shared some stuff on Instagram recently where it was all these different interviews and Rolling Stone came and all these different magazines came and would always look at our shows and we did bands with Christian bands and general market bands and mixed everything together. 
And at one time we were kind of like the biggest hardcore venue in, uh, because of Jeremy Rich, because he had so many connections with the hardcore company groups and stuff. I didn't really listen to hard. I was more of a punk guy. And but we brought in all these bands, you know. Um, we had Taken Back Sunday play once. Um, I, that was so packed that the paint was bubbling off the walls. Um, and we never made a profit. I would pay the bands. We'd pay the bands what they asked. And here you have this ministry that's been linked to the Church of Christ, who's main focus is homeless people and they're losing money with me <laughs> and my staff who are a bunch of rap scallions but they believe like there's something here and they they were they used to talk about the you know they used to have this tour called the unholy land tour and they would take it through all, all these satanic places in atlanta and one of them was um one of them was this place called The Masquerade, and like, oh, The Masquerade. And I used to party there, and I was like, it's not as bad as they make it out to be, but they're like, The Masquerade's a really bad, heaven, hell, and purgatory. Well, after we left Safe House, we ended up having services at The Masquerade. Um, but none of that would have happened had Philip and them not given me the chance, Philip Bray, who was the, the head of, uh, of the Assemblies of God, I mean, the head of Assemblies of God, not Assemblies of God, head of Safe House, had never given me the chance. I and mean, I would sit there and argue politics with everybody there. I would be like, you know, because they would make fun of Bill Clinton and all this. And I would argue back, you know. <laughs> um, but I was included. And I'm preaching grace. And I'm preaching these radical messages. And I'm doing all this stuff. And they kept me on. And then even after we left and we started the thing, uh, my friend Stuart Damron came on. And he was a businessman in Atlanta and owned all these body shops. And he goes, I want to help revolution. I want to help you guys actually become a 501c3. I want to help you all do all this. I'm also Republican evangelical guy. I want to help you do all this stuff. You can have offices in my built in my, my, one of my body shops. We want to see revolution happen. Um, a Calvinist guy comes along and says, Hey, we love what you're doing. Blah, blah, blah. We want to make, I know of a group that will give you $75,000 a year just to do revolution. Oh, fantastic. You know, and these guys saw something within me and within the community and what we work we were doing and built into that foundation, built into that work. Um, and in 2005, I believe it was, 2005 or 2006, I decided that I was, I could no longer uh, be silent about supporting my LGBTQ brothers and sisters. And then I had to say something. And I went and I went and sat down with my board. And my Calvinist friend told me I was wrong and that if I said it was okay to be gay, that all the money, the big grant that we got every year was gone. I said, that's fine, because <laughs> I have to do this. <laughs> I'm not doing it for money. This is my conviction. Um, this Dr. King quote, it will be, it's not the words of your enemies but the silence of your friends just kept ringing through my head, ringing through my head, ringing through my head. And I said, I have to speak up. And Stu says, man, damn it, Jay, I don't agree with you. Um, and, and at this point, had the majority of the board disagreed with me, they could have voted me out. I said, don't vote me out until, in, in, until after the next revolution, because I want to announce this at revolution. But he said, I'm not going to vote you out. I'm going to disagree with you, but we're still going to work together. And... Me and Stu had some really knockout, drag out arguments about it, especially because I ended up leaving revolution in Atlanta to him. And the reason was, is not because he agreed with me. It was because I knew that he could disagree and still love me and still care about me. And I knew that if there were other people in the community, they would always be welcomed, even if they disagreed with him. And this is uh, the positive things I saw in evangelicalism. I've seen a lot of bad things as well, but I've talked probably years about them and written about the bad things that happened, but I don't know if I've talked about the good things, you know? And even when I lived in Arizona, I remember one of these like really rich, wealthy, white Arizona guys saying like, yeah, I see the work you're doing, you know, and I heard you need a car. And he gave me like a, this was 94. He gave me an 87 Hyundai hatchback that I called the Millennium Falcon because it was this like white beat up car and we called it the Millennium Falcon. Um, had a big hole in the back from when I ran into a stage because uh, we always did concerts everywhere. So we did concerts one time in our yard and I forgot that there was a stage in our yard. So I got a giant hole through it. Um, now there was a lot of guilt 
I mean, that first year of revolution, I really struggled with thinking God hated me all the time. Um, I, I thought something was wrong with me because I couldn't do anything right. You know, but there was also people involved who really wanted to believe in what we were doing. And, and I can't, you know, it's so easy to, to just write people off, you know? Um, even like when I met with Joel Olstein when I was working with Soul Force, you could tell that Joel Olstein was in a way trapped by his success and by the people around him. Because I talked about being gay affirming and said how important I thought it was and this type of thing. And he knew I was right. I could tell he knew I was right. I could tell he agreed with me, but the people, he had people around him that just were like, this is never going to happen. You know, even when he started to come around and say, well, like, I see what you mean. They were like, it'll, ne I mean, they literally spoke above him and said, this will never happen. Our church will never be that way, you know. Um, so if it wasn't for people, those folks, in my life and those some of those folks came along with me later down the line became affirming uh, became inclusionists became these things over time and we all had to grow together because it was just you know you get used to a way of living but there were these very kind people who were you mean and I, I, you know, I, I the funny thing is with that uh, the Church of Christ Church I ended up becoming best friends with the youth pastor at this big Mount Perrin Church of Christ and so they were doing a big music, Christian music festival, and they hired me to do their underground fest, which was really crazy. Um, and I ended up working with them. And that was, a, there was a, that was a nightmare, too, in a lot of ways. But it was also an opportunity to connect with a lot of these bands and a lot of different people. And one of the great things I, I always loved about going to these festivals and these events is... LGBTQ folks have been so rejected that I think they have a radar for knowing safe people. And often when I would go to these festivals, gays, lesbian folks would reach out to me who were there being like, hey, can we talk to you? We're here, but we don't know if we really belong here. And that was always a great opportunity for me. And that also helped me grow, is being into this community and working with with people, you know, having that safe, being known as a safe person was really, to me, the greatest compliment I could ever have. And would have so many amazing conversations. And some of those people who were brave enough to go into those festivals and to be amongst people who didn't agree with them or had convictions against them, those people gave me the strength and led me, those brave few people, made me realize that one day I was like, I can't be silent anymore. I have to speak up. No matter if it, and it, and it did destroy me financially. Never, never got, never recovered from that. But it's not about that, you know. It's about those people were brave enough to be in a scary situation and then reach out to me and take that chance. And it made me realize I have got to say something. I have got to speak up. I have got to do something. Um... So that has been, you know, those are the experiences you have. And those are really interesting, unique experiences that we can grow from. And we don't have to, you know, so when we talk about evangelicals, we have to remember the positive things that we had. There were communities that we were a part of. There were people who loved us, but they had a limit, unfortunately. And unfortunately, they think that limit is given to them by God. And they, and I always say, well, those people must be true believers if they're willing to, like, exclude people on that behalf. I don't think they understand the religion they're following, but I know the traditions behind it. And so, you know, I just have gotten to the point in my life where I care so much about people who are conservative, people who are liberal, people who are progressive, people who are gay, people who are straight, people who are black, people who are white, people who are all colored, that I want to see us try to work towards peace some sort of peace, even if that peace is tolerance, where we're just allowing each other to live life safely, live life that's uh, less suffering, 
live life where we can all make a living, where we can learn to be tolerant. If they can be tolerant of us, then maybe we can show some tolerance toward their intolerance. I know that sounds crazy, but that's the kind of ideas that you have to think about when it comes to a peace process. Um, and so what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that every now and then we've got to look back and be appreciative for where we've come and coexisting is a fallacy. No, it's not. You should read a book by John Hume, Andrew. It's about the troubles and the, the, the civil, civil war that they were having with 30 year long civil war in Northern Ireland. Um, John Hume, was, who was a Catholic, was so caring, so compassionate, so passionate that he brought in people from, he brought in Protestants to work beside him. And it made the IRA so angry, which that was a Catholic organization. They tried to bomb and burn his house down, but it took 30 years and they signed the Good Friday Agreement, which was peace, where everybody got to exist. And where Northern Ireland, if it ever wanted to be out from underneath the UK, they could vote and they could just be a part of Ireland. I mean, that happened. So coexisting is not a fallacy. It's only a fallacy because it's big and it's because it's scary and because we don't see it happen all the time because they shot Dr. King, because we don't talk about in America about Northern Irish politics, you know, now that it's not so sexy and violent anymore, but it happened. And I'm going to wake up every day and never believe that coexisting is a fallacy. Now we're always going to have a hard time. We're always going to have struggles, but if we can get out away from being involved in the government and we can get out away involved from this kind of stuff and we can get a government that ignores the religions, religion and other people might be able to argue well and disagree well. I'm not saying roses, I'm not saying utopia, but what I'm saying is, is that we're always going to have issues with each other because we're human. We're human beings and we're all different. I might look like a punk, but probably most punks I would sit down with and we'd probably disagree over stuff. You know what I mean? I, I, I see myself as a leftist, but then, you know, and progressive, but then I see myself heck the time disagreeing with progressives and arguing with them, you know. The nuances, the, the idea that we have these identities that we hide behind, these identities we almost create as a mask that causes us to remain separate and we scapegoat each other. The fact is, is saying, I'm going to take a step further. Um, but I just want to say, like, you know, it's these evangelicals revolution and this word and what I'm saying to you right now and me going crazy being like, we can work this out. Like, you know, at least into a small point. I mean, I, you know, I get it. Like we've got all these wars all over the world. People are killing each other. People hate each other. But if we had more people like John Humes in this world who believed that, you know, we have to learn to exist together um, let me read a couple things about, about that. Uh, first of all, institutions will have to change. Um, and that takes a long time. And for a lot of us, we always kind of focus on the, like, who's next, what's next. We're not seeing the bigger picture of, of, of nonviolence. We're not seeing the bigger picture of uh, uh, working together. So often we're going like, oh, if Trump comes in, everything's going to be destroyed, or if... Biden wins and we're all going to do just, you know, oh, you know, get, and we have to look beyond those things. We, we, you know, it's going to require patience. John Hume literally spent his whole life, signed, the, got the peace treaty signed, they found peace, and then he uh, started to uh, suffer from um, uh, uh, Alzheimer's and, and started to, to lose his memory and couldn't remember any of the th great things he did. It, it was really sad. But he spent his whole life doing it. So I'm not saying that this is going to happen overnight. I don't even know if, the, probably the way I see it, it won't happen in our lifetime. But I believe so firmly in it that I want to be the spark that lights the match. You know what I mean? I want to continue to do it. So when Andrew thinks about it, he's like, all right, well, it might seem like a fallacy, but I'm going to practice it today. You know, when I first talked to my friend Zoe, they did not, they were a lot more cut off to people. And now that... Zoe and I have had all these great conversations. They are reaching out to more people than I even am. You know, this is the great thing is that we can take these infinite ideas 
as finite beings and pass them on. And when we start to pass on these ideas as finite beings, when we pass them on, they start to become infinite ideas. Someone decided, John Hume wrote a book, and then someone wrote a book about John Hume, and I had to order that book from Northern Ireland to get here, but that was me getting that idea passed on to me through the mail, through all these things, through another culture, so I could believe and be more encouraged in the idea of peace and the concept behind peace and the work that it takes, but also realizing that that's why patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Because anger versus anger is not doing it. It's not going to do anything. If you keep doing the same thing and respect and a different outcome, you are insane. And I think that's one of the things that bothers me mostly about my progressive brothers and sisters lately is I feel like they've taken a play, ripped out a page of the playbook of the uh, conservative evangelical Christians, <laughs> and now they're just fighting anger with anger. And uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't change things. Um... That was Einstein who said uh, insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. And so all I'm saying is, is like, let's try some different things. Let's try some different, let's see if it's impossible. Let's prove that it's impossible. If coexistence is a fallacy, let's prove that it's a fallacy, but let's prove it through patience and hard work and through community. And the thing is, is it will take time because it's going to take time for a lot of us to heal. You know, like I said, those few folks, LGBTQ folks who came to these Christian festivals and would find me, you know, they were the few. There was a lot of people who were like, I don't want anything to do with those people. I don't want to, you know, LGBTQ folks are like, I don't want anything to do with Christians. I, I don't blame them because they've been hurt. But there's those few who go, okay, I'm going to take this pain and I'm going to transfer it into something else or I'm going to deal with my pain and I'm going to go in and I'm going to go talk to these people. And what happens is, revolutionary things happen. Pastors start saying, like, I'm affirming, I'm affirming, I'm affirming, you know. And I slowly, over the years, watch these people come. I watched gay marriage pass fast. I, we literally, I thought gay marriage would have been 20 years longer, in our, but we watched it pass faster. Some of the people who became affirming, you know, I, I'm really surprised and, and grateful. And, and like the, uh, and, uh, the Methodists just opened up all the doors for affirming. The Lutherans, I mean, two of the biggest... Uh, mainline denominations in this world are now affirming. So it does happen, and it's happened in my lifetime. It's happened in 20 years. So things can happen that we never expected to happen. Um, breaking down barriers between the different sections of Christianity and politics is going to be part of it. It's a tax, but the thing is, the what makes it important is it's a task that involves everyone. You want to talk about inclusion. We talk a lot about inclusion. We give a lot of word service to not scapegoating, and I'm an inclusive. And <laughs> you really want to be inclusive. That's when it says, dine your flesh and taken up your cross. Everybody doesn't like those verses, but when you think about it, that's inclusion. That's the love that never gives up, never loses faith, always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. Um, that's what we're talking about here, is that task because it's a task that doesn't just involve us. It's a task that involves everyone involved to play a part. And, um, and that's tough. That's tough work. I, you know, and the fact that, you know, like if people want to call me a dreamer and call me naive, that's okay. I've been called naive by some of the greatest people on earth. Um, my people I were, you know, I, I've liked, that's okay. And I, but also some of my greatest heroes were told me that their work was impossible. Um, and, and they kept going and, and made a lot of sacrifices to get there. And I feel like that's what I do with my own life. Um, the only unity that can, these are, I'm just reading from my notes. The only unity that we can work is a unity that respects diversity and legitimizes differences. And we don't fear this because everyone must be part of the Reformation project. Everybody's got to be part of reforming this thing. Everybody. It isn't going, we're reforming from this group. It's saying we've got the whole group and it's got to reform together. we got to do it together. And luckily the church is dying enough that people might be just desperate enough to reform together. Mutual fear will not bring us together. Only mutual trust. 
mutual fear, and I see a lot of people using fear tactics against others, it's really a great way to become popular. It's really a great way of making people afraid of something and acting as though you're going to save them from something is a very good way to get a following and, 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 and to raise finances and, and to do those things. Um, I know some people who can just do it in their sleep. Um, but mutual fear will not bring us together, only mutual trust. And that takes time and that takes patience and that takes, it takes courage. It takes courage to sit down with your enemies. It took courage for John Hume to sit down with the guy who was ordering his house to be firebombed. Um, tolerance, you know. If we start to see people and encourage them the for freedom of conscience, freedom of liberty, and the individual civil religious freedom of each person, you know, like, okay, you're not going to agree with me. Your religion isn't going to agree with me. But can we do something where we both can exist together? So maybe coexistence isn't the point. Maybe just existing is the point. Maybe it's like we don't have to coexist where we just agree with each other, but can we agree to disagree, but be in a place where we all know we're safe and taken care of and where we really are practicing loving your neighbor as yourself. We really are practicing loving your enemy, doing good to those who persecute you. Like we're really practicing that, that everybody has a place at this function. I'm not going to say a table. There's a lot of tables. But at this function where we all know that at least we all have tables to sit at. If we start thinking of politics as something for everyone, it's not just for the right anymore, it's not just for the left anymore, it's not just for the progressive anymore, it's something for everyone. It always makes me sad when I see my friends stop talking to me and stop communicating with me and stop sending me little funny messages on Instagram and things when I can tell that my politics are different than theirs and I can tell that it's made them uncomfortable. Like it always bums me out because I don't want politics to be a reason to kind of create division all the time. I'm like, I'd rather us be able to sit down and talk about it sometime together. Um, but we've got to think of politics. I think of politics and religion is for everyone. Doesn't mean we're all going to join the same denomination and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. And I think, you know, freedom of religion is important, but I think uh, religion should never be the law. Religion should not be part of the law. I mean, Paul was, Paul, and, you know, free from the religious law, but it should also be free from national law. It should never be the law. And um, this will be painful. It is painful. It's painful to talk about. It's painful to just feel like no one's listening. You know, it's painful to be like, I, I can't even do the job I've been doing for 30 years. I can't even do, you know, it doesn't even work as a job anymore. I mean, those things are painful. Um, losing your voice is to, and, and, and losing, you know, and not having a voice within the communities and things like this is painful. It's painful. Um, it's painful to be divisive. It's painful to hurt each other. Um, it's painful. Loving enemies is tough. Loving those who, don't, who, who think God doesn't accept you is tough. It is hard. You know, I mean, I, my dad called me out of the blue just recently, and unfortunately we ended up arguing because he was worried that I wasn't going to make it to heaven. And, and so it was a tough conversation, but I really loved my dad, and I got off the phone and I felt awful, and I felt like I made, I got angry, and I didn't want to be angry, and I just wanted to talk to him because he's probably not going to be around much longer. Um, and so I get it, accepting people who don't, think you're worthy or thinking that they could spend eternity without you is really, really hard. It's really hard work. And I think it's often so hard is because of our own self-doubt as well, because it's something that they're saying is, 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 is getting into our mind and, and causing us to feel not included or not accepted or causing us to question something in our head. And I think we have to get to a point where we're strong enough and where we can we, we, we surround ourselves with good people and we encourage each other uh, through affirmation and through conversations and things like that. So when we do get this kind of kickback from different groups, 
uh, we can kind of start to free ourselves from self-doubt and we can just go like, you know what, there's people who don't like me and that's okay. I can accept that. I don't want to be everybody for everybody anyway. You know, that's the great thing. There's great, there's a lot of music out there that I do not understand, but some people love and are crazy about, you know, and I like my music and a lot of people don't like that. You know, it, it, it's, it's life. Um, I would just hope that if we could just get to the point where we could convince folks in the Christian faith that religion must not be used to control others, that would be a huge step. And these are all, this is tough stuff. I mean, this isn't, there's a reason we have 10 people watching right now and not, you know, 150 or not 10,000 people, you know. I'm not saying like, let me tell you how to live your best life or those people, those assholes, you know. It just doesn't, it's not the most popular thing. So not using religion to control is also loving your enemies. Looking back and talking about seeing the good in those who you've moved on from and remembering the good things and realizing that some of those people gave you the very tools to be where you're at and to do the work you're doing is loving the other. It's loving the enemy. And it's also saying, like, I don't, want, I don't want to other you. I want to say, like, you made me. I'm here because of you. You guys gave me a chance, and I'm grateful for that. You know, when, when um, I got fired from Safe House, okay? That was a tough one. I'd never been fired before or laid off or whatever. It was, it was complicated. There was a few reasons, and I caused some trouble, and some of my staff had done some things, and they felt like it was time for me to try to fly on my own little bird. Um, but it was funny because after I left, I would call... Um, I would call, it's funny because uh, Zoe just asked if I had any regrets. I would call, <laughs> I would call Philip and be like, Philip, thank you for being as patient with me as you were because I have staff now and I know the difference of what it's like to pay people and, and, and how they treat you and what they say to you and when the final buck comes down to you and the final say comes down to you. And, 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 it, and you're in charge. It's really hard. And I didn't realize how hard it was and how scary it can be, and I'm sorry. When Philip passed away last year, I made, got to make a video for his, his memorial service. And I was just like, if Philip Bray had not believed in me, I wouldn't have made it. I was so burnt out in LA from like working with big Assemblies of God group, plus that was the denomination that kicked my family out. I was so burnt out from fighting to get things like smoking sections and things like that and you know if Philip hadn't accepted me that time and given me those few years to really understand how a group works how staff works how being a leader really works and how being part of a community really works I don't think I could have started it on my own and I talked about that I talked about that him believing in me and him even giving me hard times and him sitting down you know he used to be like oh we're on J time because I would show up to all the staff meetings late you know, and I was like, oh, J time, you know, but now I realize like he could have just been like, you're fired or this or that, you know, and he, he was showing me grace. It was just, he was also frustrated that I wasn't respecting his time and the other people who worked with him, with us at that time at the time. And it took me time to learn that and to grow from that. Um, do you have any regrets on how you treated conservatives at the Hills that you were unkind and wish you had shown more grace? You know, I don't know if I have regrets about how I treated people in the past, but I maybe have regrets of things I've written or maybe sermons I've preached. Not regrets, but just kind of like I was a little bit too harsh or I was too angry. But I was hurt. And the thing for me is realizing that now when I see other people, like when I see a lot of the Instagram like progressive influencers talking about evangelicals in such a harsh way, I understand where they're coming from. I've been there. And so I don't automatically say, well, these guys are just not, these guys can't do this. I actually will reach out to them and say, I think you can do better and I think you could be more inclusive. But I don't, you know, because I, I'm grateful that some folks had patience with me up until they didn't. But, um, so I think it's given me more grace for them. I think, think learning from my mistakes has given me more grace for people who I see doing the same things. Um, 
do you remember when Gore was running against George Bush and people were voting Green Party? A lot of people were voting Green Party. And um, I remember running into some people. First of all, people were always surprised that I was a, a, a Democrat, always shocked that I was a Democrat um, <laughs> for some reason. And then, I mean, kids who thought I was like, I mean, kids who thought I was their hero. I'd kind of be like, you're a Democrat, oh my God. <laughs> you know, I can't believe it. <laughs> And I remember there were people who were Green Party people. And you think, oh, he's a punk rocker. He'd be hip to that. I was like, you can't vote Green Party because it's not going to happen. You know, now I'm kind of a third party guy. And I'm watching all these people say, you can't vote third party or Trump's going to win. You know, now I'm going like, oh, geez, that was me. I was that guy. But what it allows me to do is remember where I was at that time and give more compassion to those people because I understand the fear. I understand the insecurity. And I understand the logic behind it. So that's what I think we can all do is not dwell in our mistakes, but learn from our mistakes, learn from our losses, learn from our friendships have, that have fallen apart in the past, learn from those things and move forward and try to do better. I've been reconnecting with my friend Brian Yarborough lately. And one of the reasons was is because I realized like there is a person who's a gem, you know, a gem in my life. And I have not been talking to them. I haven't been hanging out with them. And I need more things like that in my life. But it's taken also hurts and pains from other relationships for that one to become obviously that, the, oh, there's somebody who I know I can communicate with in a way that I need in my life. But I've learned that through making mistakes and through hurting people. And I'd say maybe friendships is where I hold regrets is because I'm so introverted that I've lost friendships because of that or because I can only have like, you know, one super friend at a time, you know, and, and I regret doing that kind of stuff. And I'm 48 and I'm really just learning how important that lesson is. So we all can grow. We can all change. It's never ending. Now, I've gone 72 minutes talking about the positives of evangelicalism and the importance of peacemaking. And I think it's me and Zoe at this point. Um, <laughs> just talking to each other. We can text each other. Um, but thanks for listening. I, I hope this encourages you a little bit. This just really came to me came to me in a dream, not in a dream, but in a moment of not being able to sleep and wanting to put my money where my mouth is when I talk about not scapegoating and looking at the positives in the negatives as well. And um, so, you know, everybody's got a room at my table. And um, I hope that you can find healing enough to be able to sit at a table like that one day. That's my dream. That's why revolution exists. And I will continue to fight for that dream and that vision. And I'm, I'm so grateful for, for people like, like Beth, who just said hello, and I'm so grateful for Zoe, and I'm so grateful for a lot of you folks who come and check this thing out, and I'm so grateful for John Hume, this Irishman who realized that peace was more important than party, peace was more important than politics, and that peace was even bigger than religion, that these people had to stop killing themselves, and he realized that they had to learn to live together. And uh, it happened, and that's why I love that place so much. Um... I love it. It's good because you see, we get people like this guy who doesn't even have a name that makes it's a gif who comes in to say, I'm thinking about Hitler. And um, maybe you made that just so you could come on here and say shitty things. But you know what? One day you'll see this differently. And your life will be bigger than having to go and say crappy things to people with vision you know like we shouldn't be constantly trying to destroy each other's visions destroying each other's hopes destroying each other's visions for a better world like oh keep dreaming oh what about his oh what about this oh you know hey those are ideas and things that we're going to have to look at and uh, and problems we're going to have to face in the world but that's what we want to make less people want to make more people who are inclusive and loving and see hope for the future you know, so my hope is that Fagus one day has hope that's bigger than Hitler. 
Hitler lost, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, I hope of a day where we fight wars without weapons and we don't have to kill people. I mean, I think that's kind of a horrible way to live. Um, God, Suri, no, I'm not pro anybody. I'm pro no war. I'm pro no killing. Um, Sir, Suri, Suri, no, I'm, I am anti-war and I am pro-peace. And I think Israelis and Palestinians are going to have to come to a point where they recognize each other's humanity and have to learn to live together and stop killing each other. And I think that's the only way it's going to work. And it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of patience. Um, so that's what I believe. Um, anyway, I'm not here to solve political problems today. I'm here to share with you today's message, and that was today's message. Um, I've been 30 years of my life doing this stuff, and uh, you don't bring peace by dropping bombs. You don't coexist by killing children. Either side. That's not, that's no evidence of, of, of recognizing humanity. That is a complete disregard for humanity. I am completely nonviolent, so that's not a most popular stance and may never be. Um, I even struggle with it my own self at times. All right, folks, listen, um, we're here and I'm able to say these messages because you support our work. You can go to revolutionchurch.com and make a donation if you like what we're doing. We're a 501c3, we're a church, we're a nonprofit. And honestly, we don't exist without you. Honestly, barely existing right now. So any support you can give is appreciated. If, if you're at a place where you can't give, don't give. Don't give if you're broke. Don't give if you're poor. You know, pay your bills. Take your kids out for lunch. You know, if you're thinking like, oh, I got this money. Go do something nice for yourself. But if you're in a place where you can give and you have finances that are there, you see that, please make a donation and help us continue this work because I think it's going to better the world. I think it's going to better better meant for people. And if you believe in that and you get something out of it and you have extra, we're asking, you know, make a donation so we can exist as well and continue to exist and continue this work. And I hope we get to a point where we can uh, have these conversations on a bigger platform with people. And I'll be bringing it to, you know, I'll be talking with people in Denver and from theologians and philosophers and people from all around the country talking about unity and love and peace and place. And I will go to places and talk about this and continue to scream this to the hilltops. It doesn't matter if we have 13 people or 13 million people, this is the message, grace and acceptance and finding unity through diversity and learning how to live a life like that. I think that is the message of Christ and the message of Christianity as well. So that's what I'll continue to do. Um, I'm doing it to see the guy cry some more, ha 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 ha. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm an emotional person. I care about people and um, if meth boy, which is obviously your real name, um, it's just silly, man. Like, why do you guys do that? Like, are you in that much pain where you just think like, I've got to, hey, there's someone in pain. Let me poke them, you know? You're the person I actually think is probably closest to doing the work that I'm talking about than most people because you're in such pain that you're acting out and you're, 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 you're projecting onto other people. Um, I probably guess you probably cry a lot on your own at home. Um, and I want to say you're not alone. You know what? I get the anger. I get the like wanting to just take the piss out of buddy because the world seems mad. But you can do more with your life than that, man. I promise. You can go in and you can encourage people and you can say something really nice and you know that they might never forget. Like Meth Boy encouraged me. Why would a guy named Meth Boy say something so kind? Now I need to say something kind and love somebody else. I mean, there's been times where I've had weird, really encouraging things said. You know, like I, you know, people who just get it. Having people who I know are in different areas and different of life and believe different things, also we can come together and, and have a moment of agreement or a moment of encouragement, and it's changing, it's life changing. You know, why be you know, just don't be a little bird and just take a piss. You know, you know, <laughs> you can you know, make huge, huge changes. Um, uh, 
And it's funny because I know a lot of like I just see someone here is like frustrated that I deal with the, the, the people who say negative things. But honestly, I've spent my life as long as there's been social media, I always go to the people who say negative things and have conversations with them. And I've had some really great friendships grow out of the people who've made fun of me and said horrible things. And so I just try to love people the best I can and disagree well. And I think that's part of disagreeing well, you know, um, is not ignoring them. I mean, they're obviously looking for attention and, and are hurt. So why not give them something positive to think about and encourage them to be better? Um, you know, maybe the next kid that they talk to, they won't say something. And maybe that next kid they're saying something to is on the edge of their life. You know, somebody doesn't need to be bullied. And maybe that was the end of a bully. You never know. That's the work I do. I love you guys. I hope you'll support our work and what we're doing. I love you all. I will be here next week. Hopefully we will be talking about Paul Tillich. If I'm not, if I'm here next week, we'll be talking about Tillich. There's a small chance I might not be here. And if I'm not here, Josh will be here. But I love you all. You are accepted. Here is a safe place, not a safe place, but a place for you to come and talk and be different and have interesting thoughts and have different political beliefs and different spiritual beliefs. This is where revolution is. And we love you and we hope that this is a place for you to grow because we gotta we gotta we gotta change that world. All right, love you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. To make your 100% tax deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website.